Okay, today we are looking at the answers to test B in our Regents Review Book, starting with number 25, which is part 2, going all the way through number 37, part 4. I just want to point out when we uh, first begin here that at the beginning of each section, part 2, part 3, part 4, you're going to see these directions up here. Probably you're not reading them because you're just going right to the problem, okay? But you need to know that it says clearly indicate all the necessary steps, including any formulas you use, diagrams, graphs, okay, let me charts, tables of values, that type of thing. Okay, it's not going to be like when I give you homework where I say show all work on, on certain problems. You must show work on all problems to get full credit, okay? So with that being said, let's get started. Number 25, they want to know if you add a rational number and an irrational number, if that sum is going to be rational or irrational. Patrick says that it would be irrational, and he is correct. Okay, 4.2 is rational because it's a terminating decimal. Any fraction is also rational because any fraction can be divided and written as a terminating decimal or a decimal that repeats with a pattern. Okay. Now something that's irrational would be, for example, pi. A number that goes on forever and ever, never ends, never has a repeating pattern. Um, square root of a non-perfect square, all of those are irrational like the square root of 2 or the square root of 3 and so on. Because when you take the square root of a perfect square, that's rational because you get an answer that is a terminating decimal. Okay, so anytime that you add an irrational number to another number or you subtract it from a number, your answer will have to be irrational. And you can see my explanation right there. Okay, justify your reasoning in this case Really, it's going to take words, even though it doesn't say explain. Okay, let's go on to number 26. So here we have a two-way table showing us students from 9th to 12th grade in three or more clubs, two clubs, and one club. So if there are 180 total students, now notice they haven't totaled these for you. Okay, you could total them across to see what the 9th graders are, across for the 10th, 11th, and so on and then total down the columns for the clubs and get all of your totals, okay? So, but they're telling you if there are 180 students total in the ninth grade, what percentage of the ninth grade students, remember we're gonna use is over of to do these or part compared to whole. So of is in the denominator. So the ninth grade students go in the denominator and they just told us the ninth grade students were 180. So what's going to go in the numerator? The ones that belong to more than one club. So more than one club means you're a ninth grader that could belong to two clubs or you're a ninth grader that could belong to three or more clubs. So you have to add those together, divide to get a decimal, and they ask for the percentage. So then you have to convert it to a percentage by moving the decimal two places to the right. Please make sure you always go back and reread the directions and that you have answered the question the way they want it, in the form they'd like it. Okay, number 27, we have a function table here. And they want to know which ordered pair, negative 4, 1, or 1, negative 4, would result in a relation that is no longer a function. Well, right now this is currently a function because there are no repeats in the domain or the x values. Okay, so if we want to make it not a function, we just have to put in an x value that will be repeating with the x values there. Now if we put the 1 in, that does not repeat with anything, it would still remain a function. But putting in that negative 4 right here, then we're going to have these two repeating and it is no longer a function. Okay, this one did say to explain your answer. Okay, moving on to number 28. They want us to subtract this trinomial from this one, which means this one's going to go down on the bottom, being subtracted from. Now, when we subtract, we know that all of the terms have to be made the opposite in that second 
polynomial. Now when you see the word subtract or if you see a subtract sign, do this like you're distributing the negative one and these all are made the opposite. Then you're going to go down the columns and combine like terms. And they tell you that your answer is going to be a trinomial. So if for some reason you didn't get a trinomial, you know something's up. You've got to go back and check it out. Okay, moving on to number 29. They want you to solve this equation algebraically for x. What you should notice right away, okay, when they ask you to solve an equation, it's either going to be linear or quadratic. So you're going to look at it and look for the x term and see what is the highest exponent in your equation. Here it's squared, so we know it's a quadratic equation. When we solve quadratic equations, step one, before you pick a method for solving, is to put that function into standard form. Remember, it's the ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Okay? Now, once it's set equal to zero, then you have three choices for solving. You could either use factoring, which I would go to first because it's usually the quickest and easiest. You could use completing the square or the quadratic formula. Remember, completing the square, the x squared term needs to have a 1 in front of it. Quadratic formula works all the time, works for any, all the time. The quadratic formula is on the uh, formula reference sheet at the beginning of the regions. Even if you think you remember the formula, double check it to the reference sheet, okay, because I've already had kids that are doing that and they're putting the wrong sign in the middle and um, getting it wrong. So it's there for you to use. Take the time to check it and make sure it's appropriate. Okay, so in this one, you f I chose factoring. And I looked through first, and when we factor, you always first want to look for a greatest common factor, and there is not one. So then you look at what you have for a polynomial, and I have a trinomial. So in this case, factoring a trinomial, I'm looking to find two factors. Each will be a binomial, okay, that are going to multiply back to that trinomial. Once you have factored it, use your smiley faces to make sure that it works. So in the middle here, I'm getting negative 14x, and then on the outside, a positive 2x, that would give me a negative 12x. You definitely want to do that to make sure that it works before you proceed. Now I'm going to get that out of the way here, okay? And then once you do that, you take each factor individually, set it equal to zero, and now you have two separate equations that need to be solved. So this is a really basic, both of these are very basic equations to solve. Get x by itself, okay? You could take this, you could have 3.5 here, and negative 0.5, of course, because they are equivalent, so that is fine. And I'm also going to show you down below, I did it using the quadratic formula, in case this is how you did it and you wanted to be able to look at the work. Of course, more chances of making mistakes here, but if you weren't able to factor um, above, then this could be an option for you. Okay? But again, this will only work once your quadratic is in standard form. Okay, moving on to number 30. We're still in the two-point questions. Graph the following function on a set of axes below. Okay, so here we have piecewise defined function. Okay, so that's when we have more than one function that we are going to graph, and they give us restricted domains for each one. So here we have an absolute value, okay, and they said that my x values in the table will start at negative 3 and go to positive 1, and I have an equal to here with a negative 3, so when I graph it, that point will get a closed circle, and I have just the less than here, so this point will get an open circle. Okay, and then we have this constant, which means it's going to be a horizontal line, and the domain values in the table will go from 1 to 8, and because both inequalities have equal to, that means at the point with the x value of 1, that'll be a closed circle, and at an x value of 8, that'll also be a closed circle. That's all the prep work to get ready to graph it. That's the worst part of the whole thing. Okay, once you have all that work done, 
then you can go ahead and graph. Notice they did not give us a scale here. So we had to go around and establish a scale. Okay, you can see my graphing from the tables, my open and closed circles. Don't forget, this is a function. It needs to pass the vertical line test. Okay, so when we do this, this needs to work. And notice this works because one circle is open and one is closed. You will never have two closed circles together like that vertically because then you won't have a function. Make sure that you label your functions as well. Okay, let's go to the next one. So number 31, a gardener is planting two types of trees and they describe each type. And you can see from each type that I have written over here, my function rules are both linear. They're growing. Each one is growing at a constant rate of change. Algebraically determine exactly how many years it will take for these trees to be the same height. If I want them to be the same height, then I'm going to take each expression that I wrote here and I'm going to set them equal to each other. But the tricky part is, okay, when I wrote this, I'm reading it and I said, okay, start out at three feet tall, and we're gonna grow 15 inches per year, and so on here. And at that point, it wasn't really clicking with me until I went to set these equal to each other, and I said, well, these units of measure all need to be the same. So if your rate of change is in inches, then the height of the trees need to be in inches as well. Otherwise, you will not get the correct answer. Okay? So then solving it is very simple. Um, make sure you give a label. And that is the tricky part for sure right there. And I was also going to suggest, because this is actually is like a system of equations, when you're setting them equal to each other, you could put them into your graphing calculator under y equals. You could put each one in under y equals and then look for their point of intersection to confirm it. But again, if you don't put 36 and 48, you will get a point of intersection using the 3 and the 4, and you're not going to realize what happened. Okay? So just make sure that when you do these that they are in the same units. Number 32. This baby is a little tricky really isn't once you realize what you need to do it's actually very simple but at first it's not so simple they want you to write a function rule for this exponential function okay well if, you know if they wanted me to write a function rule for a linear function and they showed me the graph that'd be so easy i'd look for the um, y-intercept and i would calculate the slope but here they have an exponential function and we know with an exponential y is equal to a times b to the x power a is our original amount, our starting amount, and B is what our base is doing, doubling, tripling, growing, decaying. Those could be decimal values. I mean, how am I going to figure that out from here? And I notice that the y-intercept here is low. I don't really know what it is. I mean, I can guesstimate, but it could be most anything. Well, think about when we did regression models in this last unit. We could be given data values, x and y values, put them into our graphing calculator, and then we could look at the scatter plot to see the trend of the data. And then if the trend was linear, we ran a linear regression. That was number four on the graphing calculator. If it looked exponential, we could run an exponential regression. That was number zero. And if it's quadratic, we could run a quadratic regression. So. This one requires you to think about that and say, okay, well, how can I do that? Well, I can get my own data points to put into list one and list two. All I have to do is take them right off of here. There are some I don't know, but there are one, two, three, four points I do know because they're very obvious and they made it that way on purpose. So I record those values right here in the table to show all my work, clearly showing all my steps. Then I go to the calculator put this data into list one and list two, run the exponential regression, let the calculator do the work for you, and it comes back with an A value of 0.25 and a B value of two, and then you're able to sub them into that function rule. Now, they want you to explain how you did this. You cannot say, I used my calculator. Okay, you can talk about using your calculator, but you need to give me specifics. You can't just say, I used my calculator. Okay. How did you use it? Now look, at I simply wrote a, a quick sentence. I entered the x and y values into my calculator. And I ran an 
exponential regression to find the equation. That simple. Okay, now we're into the four point questions and there are four of these. So we have Zach and Jacob going to the movie theater and purchasing popcorn and drinks. I am pretty sure that you will have a system of equations to solve on your regions just because there usually is. And they're actually very easy to solve, although for some reason kids seem to be struggling with these. Okay, you'll know it's a system. First of all, notice here, they wrote it. Write a system, which means you'll have two different variables, two equations, and two answers, which makes sense because they're talking about popcorn and drinks. Okay, notice I wrote my let statements right up here. I like to use the letters of the objects I'm describing. For me, it helps me to keep them straight, okay? And my two original equations are right here. And I know every one of you can write those. That, those are not difficult. Okay, once you get to that point, you need to decide if you're gonna solve this using substitution or elimination method. Substitution is when you have one of the equations where it's gonna be like y equals or x equals, maybe. 2 plus 3x, and then I can sub this into the second equation everywhere I see a y. That's your substitution method. You do not want to use substitution when your variables have all have numbers like this in front of them, because then you are going to have fractions over on this part. You do not want to go there, okay? That's not a good idea at all. Only use substitution if, if they already have one that's in a y equals or an x equals, or maybe they have an equation, like, let's say like y minus 2 equals 3x, and it's very simple for you to add the 2 over there, and then you can say, okay, that wasn't so bad, I can sub that in, okay? But otherwise, do not use substitution. Let's get that out of here for now, okay? And let's look and see what I did. I used the elimination method. I saw here that I had... 2 and 4. So I knew if I multiplied this 2 by a negative 2, these would cancel. That's one way to use elimination. I could have tried to eliminate the d's, but I would have had to multiply the top one by a negative 2 and the bottom one by a positive 3. Okay, or I could have switched the signs positive 2 and negative 3. That was two multiplications. I chose to use negative 2 because then I would only have one multiplication. So I distribute through here. This is what I end up with as a transformed equation. Then my p's cancel because we cannot solve these with two variables in them. So by canceling out one of the variables, then you have one variable left that you can solve for, and you find out the drinks are two and a quarter. Then you can take the cost of the drinks, you sub it into one of the original equations, either this one or this one. You see that I subbed it in here, did the math, and found out popcorn was 575. Okay? They want you to determine and state the price of a bag of popcorn and of a drink to the nearest cent. So I just wrote a sentence using labels, of course. Really a simple problem. Okay? So make sure you understand this because those are going to be there. I'm pretty sure anyway. Number 34, the graph of an inequality is shown below. So when we graph inequalities, we have solid lines, we have dotted lines. We shade above, we shade below. Where they overlap, if we have two lines, is the solution set where we're gonna put a capital S. Okay, it says write the inequality represented by the graph. So we have this line right here that they want us to write an inequality for. Well, first thing I notice is that it's a solid line. I notice it has a y-intercept of negative three. And then you notice here I calculated the slope to be positive 2. I also notice the shading is above the line over here, so that indicates greater than. And with a solid line, when you have greater than and a solid line, you're going to have a symbol of greater than or equal to. So here is my slope, my y-intercept, and this inequality represents the solid line shaded above. Okay. Then what they want you to do is on the same set of axes, graph this inequality. Well, first thing you're going to have to do is get it into y equals format. Okay? So moving the x over and then dividing everything by 2. The inequality sign stayed the same. It only changes when you're dividing by a negative. So then I look at this and I put down my information for graphing, my method of graphing. 
m equals b equals and I say okay no equal to so dotted line less than shade below and then you can see where I made that line apologize for all the looks like confusing to me you can see it right here I hope it's a dotted line okay shaded below okay with that y intercept what was it a positive 2 and a negative slope negative 1 over 2 okay and then this would be where I put my S for my solution set where the shadings overlap and then they want more the two inequalities graphed form a system that is correct Oscar thinks the point 2 1 is in the solution set determine and state whether you agree with Oscar explain your reasoning so there are several things they want you to do right in problem C so point 2 1 so the point 2 1 you see right here I have 2 1 is right on the line right on the line now what that means is on a solid line it means it will work it will be part of the solution but on a dotted line it will not it's not included in the solution because of the dotted line okay and I could talk about that do they say uh, they do not say if I have to do if I have to answer this using the graph or using algebra so I had a choice okay they don't always give you a choice but I state that I do not agree with Oscar while the point satisfies one inequality as I said the inequality with the solid line it does not satisfy the other one and then I'm showing more proof of it I'm um, using algebra this is not necessary down here at the bottom you don't have to show two ways but I wrote these in case somebody showed it this way I subbed in the X and Y value into each inequality and proved that one worked and one didn't however if I'm not going to show the algebra I would need more in my my reasoning um, I have it satisfies one inequality it does not satisfy the other eh, maybe you could get away with that but I would probably want to solidify it by giving some more details and saying that um, what I talked about about the line that was solid it works for that one but not the one that's dotted okay okay moving along to number 35 so we have this table of values and they want us to write the correlation coefficient for the line of best fit so our prediction line and they tell us that we're going to use a linear regressions so we know that that is stat calc number four and they want the answer to the nearest hundreds when you're taking the regions you are going to want to be under you know, you're good. okay I'm getting tongue tied here you are going to want to underline important information that you want to make sure you remember and you're also going to want to go back and read it twice so the correlation coefficient is your R value when you run a linear regression so you will need to input this data into list 1 and list 2 in your calculator you do not need to look at the scatter plot because they have told you that it's going to be a line of best fit so you already know that so this is the correlation coefficient you should have gotten this is it rounded to the nearest hundreds then they want you to explain if it suggests um, what the correlation coefficient suggests in the context of this problem they use this a lot in the context of this problem what that means is when you're explaining it use the details from the problem so we're going to talk specifically about the calories and the sodium in a hot dog okay now remember when we describe a correlation coefficient two adjectives direction positive negative and then strong weak okay because they moderate I've never seen them go there just because it's a gray area um, it's really easy to tell if it's strong or it's weak okay so this is a positive strong correlate correlation because we know one is a perfect correlation in the positive end okay and so it is considered strong between this is where I'm talking about in the context of the problem between and just compare what's up there calories in a hot dog and milligrams of sodium I just copied down the labels from the table but you got to really clue into that context of the problem explain where it came from okay number 36 given a quadratic function rule state whether the vertex rep represents a maximum or a minimum point for the function explain your answer okay well because of the negative in the front of this function a negative a value 
we know that our function is going to open upside down. The vertex will be up at the top, which makes it the highest value in the function that makes it a maximum value. Okay, you can put this function rule right into your graphing calculator in y equals. You can go to the table of values, look for symmetry, and in the middle of that symmetry will be your vertex point. Okay, my explanation, um, I said because it is reflected, and I'm referring, telling y, I'm referring to it, because of the negative x squared, it opens downward and has a maximum value of 425. Okay, so um, there are other ways to say it, but make sure you're giving a lot of information and details. Rewrite it in vertex form by completing the square. Okay, well, vertex form when completing the square is y equals a x minus h squared plus k, where h comma k is your vertex. Okay, so I put a y in there. You could have left the f of x. Really probably should have, right, because that's what they have right there. You want to leave it here. This isn't like completing the square where you put a zero in and you're going to take the square root at the bottom. We don't want to take the square root. We need to end with a squared up here, okay, because this is a quadratic function. So other than that, other than those few things, it is very similar to the way we complete the square normally. So what you do is you have your variable all by itself here on one side. And when your x squared, your a value is negative, you need to multiply through by a negative 1 to get rid of that so you can factor. So that makes everything the opposite. You move your c term to the other side, okay? And then I could have saved myself a step and put my boxes in right here, but I didn't. So then I put my boxes here. Remember, to get the number that goes in your boxes, you are going to take your b value. In this case, it was negative 8. Divided by 2 is negative 4. Square it to get 16. Okay? Be careful. I, t I typically will just do 8 divided by 2 is 4 and square it to get 16. Because when students put that negative there, they tend to write negative 16. So be very careful. So this will always be a perfect square because you have now created a perfect square trinomial right here. So combining the like terms, okay, factoring this. Remember, both factors will look the same. Okay, because it's a perfect square. And so the, what you do is you take the square root of x squared and the square root of 16, and your sign comes from here. So now that I've done that, I've almost got vertex form. I just need to move that constant back over to the other side. Now when I do that, remember my y value is still negative from making the switch at the top. So now I go through and multiply everything by negative 1 again, and I end up with this. To verify you're correct, Put this into your y equals and graph it, and put your original function rule into the second y equals, so you're graphing them both at the same time, and they should overlap. Then you'll know they're exactly the same. Okay, last one. This is our big six-pointer. The six-pointer is always usually a doozy, okay, and this one is certainly a doozy. Um, so we have a park that's undergoing renovations to the gardens, and one that was originally okay I guess we have a fly going through here interesting oh he's gone okay one garden that was originally a square is being adjusted so that one side is doubled in length while the other is decreased by three meters first thing I'm gonna do I'm gonna draw pictures okay the original is a square the sides are unknown so I label it with an X they're going to change it and adjust it they're gonna double one side and decrease one side by three well, now we're going to have not a square, but we're going to have a rectangle. They're going to double. I don't know if they called it the length. I've got to look back. Uh, they don't say. They say they're going to double one side, so it doesn't matter. They double one side, so if it was x, now it's 2x. They decrease one side by 3. So this was x here, so now decrease by 3 is x minus 3. The new rectangle, so this new one, will have an area that is 25% more than the original. Well, that means that the new area is going to be 100% of the first garden and 25% more, making 125%. Okay, so we're going to use the formula area equals length times width. And then I replaced it and I said with words. This really helped me a lot. The area, I wrote in words, is 125% bigger than the area of the square. 
Now the area of the square was x squared. The new one is going to be 125% bigger, and then you had to move the decimal point in two places to get the decimal of 1.25 to calculate. The area of the new rectangle is 2x times x minus 3. Holy cow, right? And then you're going to distribute this 2x, and this is the formula you end up with. And that's all they ask you to do in the first part is write the equation. And when they ask you to write the equation, they do expect you to simplify. You cannot just stop here. They expect you to go through and simplify. Now, with that being said, I wonder if, because look, at, couldn't I, I could go even further here. I could have moved this, okay, over to this side as well. Okay, but they, you know, I'm thinking that what, the way I left it is fine, but don't leave it like back here. You need to, you need to go further than that. And I believe now I could have probably gone a step further, which would have been, if you look down a little bit, which would be right, oh, let's see, here, 2x squared, I just flipped it. I flipped it around to put my x squared on the left, and then moving this over here. So this also, I could have had this up above right there. I kind of skipped over this middle part. We've done this before. Explain how your equation models the situation. If this is an area problem, just explain. I'm multiplying the length times the width to get the area. That's all you got to explain. My equation shows the area of the new garden. Okay, the new garden is 1.25 times larger than the area of the original garden x squared. This is a little bit harder of an explanation than we're used to. We usually do literally just say, I took the length, state what it is, times the width, state what it is to equal this area. Okay, determine the area in square meters of the new garden. Okay, so I notice this is a quadratic. I move this over to get it in standard form, which you have right here. At this point, I have three methods I can use. I can use um, I, completing the square, quadratic formula, or factoring. I'm not going to use completing the square in this one, okay, because of this. And I'm going to look and see if I can factor, because that would be so much easier than the quadratic formula. This is already a bear of a problem. I look at this, and I notice they have a common factor of x, and I, move, I pull that out by dividing both terms here by x, and this is what I'm left with. Still equal to zero. I take each factor and set it equal to zero. The first factor is x equals zero. I automatically reject it because I cannot have the side of a shape equaling zero. Notice, slash it, reject. You need to write reject. If you don't, it's going to look like not equal. You're going to lose points. Okay, take this now, set it equal to 0, solve it, add 6, divide by 0.75, and we find out that x is equal to 8. Well, we're not done yet. x equals 8, they want the area of the new rectangular garden. Well, that new rectangular garden's area is 2x times x minus 3. So, Area is equal to those two being multiplied, and now I know that x is 8, so now I can sub 8 in there and do the math, end up with an answer that I label with units squared, okay, for an area answer. Holy cow, that should be worth like 12 points, not 6. Okay, let's hope we don't get anything like that. Okay, I hope you did a great job, and we're all set.